Well, thanks. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, we're going to be covering a quite interesting session regarding the end of third party cookies. Uh, we have two of the uh, most important industry leaders with us. So uh, they will be covering quite a whole lot of things that uh, most publishers are concerned about. Um, eventually, Jan's going to kick off with uh, what publishers can expect from this 2024. And then Robin's going to take uh, the conversation and uh, actually explain to us how publishers' uh, revenue is going to be affected because of the demise of third-party cookies. Eventually, after uh, both uh, sessions, and they will be discussing, hey, uh, is there any direct relation between the end of the cookies and revenue losses? When everything's finished, uh, we will open the mix, the mic, so that Everybody can just ask questions. Um, in case the mics don't work uh, for any reason, feel free to drop your questions on the chat. Um, we will be reading all the questions that you have, and hopefully we can we can cover all the issues and concerns that you guys have. Well, so without further ado, Jan, you can take the floor. Yeah. So we need to find a button. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, um, my name is Jan Winkler. I'm the CEO of Consul Manager. So I'm a bit for the for the legal part, so to say, here in this group. Um, and we are looking on uh, yeah what's going to happen or what already happened in in this year uh, a bit from the legal perspective, meaning things that are related to data protection, privacy, etc. Um, that will affect yeah the the publisher business uh, or the yeah the, the advertising business. In the yeah, in the upcoming months. Um, so um, if you can go to the first slide. So um, a while back in January, uh, we already had the first changes this year. Google um, had a requirement, or now has a requirement that you need to use the TCF. So if you're a publisher and you have uh, Google AdSense or Google Ad uh, Mob or the Ad Manager, so the, the Google advertising tools, basically. If you had any of those on your website, and you are now required to use the um, the, the TCF, so the IB Transparency and Consent uh, Standard, um, to signal to Google basically um, yeah, if consent is happening or not happening. If you don't use a CMP with TCF, then basically Google will stop showing um they stop showing ads there is a um a uh, um a phase where, where google is like in between so in 16th of january they started for mobile and web um uh, but not for 100% of the inventory but uh, i think for the first 10% or something in january and then it increased and increased and i think uh, at the end of march now they will be at 100% so if you don't have a CMP with TCF yet, then um, it's about time. Um, it's for web and mobile. CTV, so Smart TV, HPB TV, and all these things uh, will come come a bit later. So that's in, in July when it's also required to have a TCF CMP in your, in your TV app. Um, and also the important thing is not only you need to have a TCF, but you also need to have a TCF or a CMP that supports this additional consent. Um, it's not the same as the consent mode. It's not the same as the TCF. It's again something they are not really new because it is there for a while, but it's now a new version, version two. Um, it's basically another way to for the cookie banner to signal to Google that certain vendors have consent and in this case all the vendors that are not registered with the tcf uh, for example facebook booking.com ibm uh, around 600 vendors so if you're working with these vendors or when uh, if these vendors are important for you maybe they are probably are there then um, it makes sense that you have a cmp that not only supports tcf but also this uh, additional consent um and yeah i said it's required for the adsense ad mob ad manager uh, in the EU, so EEA actually, so EU plus Norway plus Iceland plus uh, Liechtenstein, and also in the UK. So kind of Europe without Switzerland. Switzerland is uh, special in this case. 
Um, so that was in January. Also in January, we had this uh, the IRB US Privacy API deprecation. So if you're in the US, um, and the US uh, websites or the US publishers have been using this privacy API um, that has been replaced with, with GPP. Um, not fully replaced yet um, because the IAB standard is not um, is not uh, is not updated fully yet. There is a piece missing uh, for the data deletion. But um, if you are in the US, if you're a US publisher, then uh, also there you had to yeah update your TCF or your your CMP implementation. So the the year already started with a lot of changes for publishers. Um, next slide. Um, and it continues with a lot of changes. So February, um, the, the Digital Service Act uh, or DSA came into force. Before it was only in force for VLOPs, so very large online platforms and very large online search engines. So that's um, the very large ones are the like uh, Google search and, and, and Facebook and stuff. Um, now, from 16th of February on, it's also applicable for the non very important, so the normal ones, let's say, so the, the normal online platforms. Um, we have a, a list there because it, it, it's really um, kind of a broad definition, but also not covering everybody. Uh, so, for example, uh, covered uh, social media platforms like LinkedIn, Xing, vContactor, stuff like this, online forums, Gute Frage, Discuss, etc. Everything that's with content sharing, uh, like Dropbox, etc. Video and music sharing, it's kind of the same, content sharing, music, music sharing. Online market places, so places where you can sell your own goods or where third parties can sell their stuff. Um, so it's not about a store, but a marketplace. Um, then we have online booking platforms like Booking.com, Expedia, and this. So where you have search results that can be sorted, right? And then you have suggestions for for um, you know buying the latest uh, or the, the best travel, for example. Uh, auction platforms, eBay, Mobile, the Air, Autoscout, etc. Price comparison platforms and crowdfunding platforms. So if your website is uh, in one of those categories and you are not a minimum, yeah, what's the word, small or smallest um, uh, um, enterprise. So that is 50 employees and or 10 million in revenues per year. So if you're below this, then you're out. If you're above and if you're uh, in one of these categories, then you are an online platform and you have additional um, transparency requirements. You have a lot, lot of other requirements, but for the advertising part, you have uh, transparency requirements. Uh, on the left side here, we see how this can look. Um, basically, what the what the law envisions, it doesn't need to be this way, but what they envision is that you have an icon on the edge or on the footer where you can click and where you can see the main parameters for the advertising. So who is advertising? So who is the advertiser? Who paid for this advertising? In case that's not the same. Um, and why do I see the advertising? So what's the main parameters? What kind of targeting was used? Um, so you can see what is what, yeah, why or how my personal data was used for for showing me this ad, and then to explain to the user how they get out of this, basically, and what can they do to change these parameters or to to yeah, opt out of the, uh, the the marketing. So that's a new requirement since February for online platforms. As I said, the definition is quite broad, but also not it doesn't cover everybody. Um, online forums and social media, for example, an example there is. If your main, if the website, the main goal is really social media or commenting or forums, then you are a platform. But let's say you're a news website and you just have a comment section under each article, then you are not a platform. So you don't need to have the DSA if you just have a comment section. But basically you need to see when the commenting and the social stuff becomes really important for the website when is a is it the main topic so to say of the website and if it's a main topic then you are a platform and yeah as i said if it's just a side topic so to say then you're not a platform 
Um, so there will be a, a, also a lot of discussion in the future uh, to find out which websites are actually platforms or not platforms. There has been a recent study by the um, Bundesnetzagentur, so the, the German federal um, uh, ministry for, for, for basically for online stuff. Um, and this study came to the conclusion that there is about 1000 um, online platforms that are affected by DSA in Germany. So if you're looking at Europe, there's probably, let's say, 10,000, 15,000, I don't know, something like this, maybe. Um, so it's it's a bigger group, but as I said, not everybody is affected. So that was February. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, then we have March. March, next laws came into effect or, or into force for certain uh, companies. Um, we have the Digital Markets Act on the 6th of March. So like last week, um, Google changed again something uh, because do Google is one of the main um, yeah, companies that's affected by the DMA. Um, they are now requiring their consent mode, consent mode V2 for Google Analytics and uh, Google AdWords. Um, so the, the, the Google Ads part. So that's not the advertising part. So if you had Google Ads on your page, but is about if you are an advertiser and you have the Google tracking on your page. So the analytics tracking and the tracking for the Google ads, for example, remarketing and everything that belongs to it. Um, so for most publishers, it's probably not a Google ads topic, but a Google analytics topic, because many of you are probably tracking your uh, their visitors with Google analytics. So since 6th of March, uh, it is very much recommended that you have the a, a CMP on a page that supports the Digital Markets Act with the Google consent mode. Um, if you don't have it, Google will basically limit the tracking. You will not see um, a personalized well, data about the, the people on your page. Uh, you will not see certain e-commerce data. Um, basically, the data is limited. Um, also, last week, we had an important ruling on the IBTCF. Um, so the standard that we just discussed uh, that was enforced by Google in January. Um, there was a court ruling by the ECG, so the highest uh, European court. Um, the background story there is that um, the IB Europe is a, is a Belgium entity, so the Belgium uh, Data Protection Authority, the APD, they um, had a, a basically a fine against the IB Europe as a and basically said that the IB Europe is a controller and they need to do certain things that controllers need to do. Um, and they are not just a, a standard standardization organization. They're more than this. Um, and the IB Europe basically um, fought against it. Um, and that whole thing went uh, before the ECG. The ECG ruled. Um, basically, there was like uh, two main questions and then three sub questions. Um, the mm, Summary of it is uh, the TC string, so the consent string, that's what the CMP creates when you click on accept. This information is personal data. Um, it is, yeah, it's it's not non-personal data. It can be personal data by definition. Um, it might be that it needs consent. It might be that it doesn't need consent. It's a bit on the details that uh, the ECG did not 100% clarify. Um, so there is wording around if it's combined with other data, for example, an IP address, then it's definitely personal data. So it's it's about we need to see what the what the what the RPD um, will say. So basically, the ECG ruled now, gave it back to the RPD, and the RPD needs to make their their own ruling based on this. Um, so the first thing is that the consent string is personal data. Uh, the second is the IB Europe is um, a joint controller with its members. So it's most likely that, for example, the IB Europe will need to um, uh, have a, a JCA, so joint controllership agreements, with um, other members. So all the members that are in the IB Europe probably need some kind of new contract, probably maybe somewhere in between. Um, and the third thing that came out there, for example, was that the IB is not a joint co controller for the processing that is based on the TCF. So everything that's on the website, um, when it's happening on the website, you give consent and then whatever the, the, the display ads are showing, that's no longer where the IB and where the TCF um, is, is, is a controllership uh, in the controllership rule. Uh, so that's again, that's just the vendor as we as we know it, so to say. Um, the whole thing is important because uh, depending on how the RPD now will do the, its own ruling, 
it can mean less or more changes to the TCF. There is already a um, an action plan from the IB Europe that is in place that should be rolled out once uh, yeah, the, the ruling is complete. And uh, depending on the RPD ruling, um, this action plan can change and can be um, can become a bit more, let's say, publisher unfriendly or a bit more publisher friendly. Let's see what it what it comes. So it stays interesting there. Um, so there is March. So that's that's what we already had. Um, now let's take a look at the future. Um, next slide, please. Sorry, so, is it possible to ask a question here? Yeah, sure. Yeah, the uh, chat is closed for some users. Otherwise, I would have posted it in the chat. So I apologize for interrupting. Um, my name is Zach. I'm from NL Times. I just wanted to ask a question about the ECJ ruling, if you could go back a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, because what I thought the ruling was, was that it determined that the TC string uh, itself is personal data within the context of GDPR. Mm -hmm. I, yes, I'm, not. I, at least I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sort of looking at a press release from the European court now. Um, mm -hmm. That's what they said. I didn't read the ruling. I just read the statement from the court. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you could go into that just a little bit further. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's 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 a bit complex, right? The, the ruling is like, I think, 100 paragraphs or something. Um, so the, the the problem is the, the content string itself in this ruling so the, the question that the court answered is basically, is the TC string personal data for the IAB Europe? And there the answer is yes, because the IAB Europe has um, the means of connecting the TC string with an IP address. And therefore, for the IAB Europe, it is personal data because they can combine it. And if you have the IP address, then basically everything that you combine with this IP address becomes personal data. Um, the problem that uh, for for a publisher, for a vendor, etc., is um, do vendors and publishers have the same means? It is likely, but it's not necessarily always the case, right? So it, there can be scenarios if you think about OpenRTB where you maybe get the TC string but not the IP address, and then there's the question: Is it still personal data? Probably yes, but also there is a case where it, where it's probably not personal data. So it's 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 really um, I should say, all of the court cases they're always like specific to this one case, right? So we can we get these answers to this one case, and we know that for yeah for this case the the answer is is personal data, but it's not a general. Um, it does not need to be always personal data. Um, the note that some commenters um, made is there is another case. Um, uh, I think it's the a case in Germany actually where the German court actually ruled that the consent string is always personal data because it's the expression of the user's wishes. And how would it not be personal if it's not the user's wish, right? It's it's kind of in the name. Um, so if you follow this ruling, then yes, personal data, consent string is always personal data. But yeah, it's, it's, it remains tricky. <laughs> we will need okay, to see you. what the what the APD would say, yeah. OK. Um, yeah, then let's continue. <laughs> so um, first quarter was is done. Um, let's look at the next quarter or the next half, maybe. Uh, in the second quarter, what will become more and more important? So Google started with the deprecation of third-party cookies. Um, they launched this privacy sandbox as an alternative, or as a box of alternatives. Um, so it's important to understand, so third-party cookies will go away. Third party, uh, first party cookies and local storage will still remain, but uh, also local storage is very limited in its features. Um, and what Google is proposing is this privacy sandbox. Um, it's important to understand it's not just one thing. It's a set of um, ideas or technologies. It's not just one thing. Basically, it's, it's a lot of things. Um, I, I picked the, the three, what I think the most important for, for publishers are. Um, three most important examples. The first thing is uh, they in this privacy sandbox, there is something called Protected Audience API. Um, it is basically Google's replacement for remarketing. So if you remarketing at the moment, if you go to a shop, um, you look at a product, you get a cookie, this cookie will say, hey, you saw this, uh, this product. And then if you go to another website, 
this website will read the cookie um, or the advertising in the website will read the cookie and will show you, you know, remarketing for this product. Um, but if you don't have third party cookies, then you, you can't have the connection between the, the shop that you saw before and the, the product uh, or the ad on the other page. Um, and this protected audience API is basically um, connecting the two dots in a privacy friendly way. Uh, so marketers can select their audience an auction will be held within the browser without uh, actually asking the the vendors. Uh, the auction will be held and then the the best matching ad for whatever reason for whatever logic will or can be shown. Um, so as I said, it's a it's a replacement for remarketing, a bit a replacement for pre-bit kind of situations. Not all of the situations, but at least the remarketing situations. Um, it's fairly complex and fairly technical, um, but it will come. It's it's the market's already the, the bigger players are already adapting to this. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is fenced frames will become a thing. Um, basically, everybody knows an iframe, right? It's a window within a window. Most of the ads are currently delivered in an iframe. Um, so if you have advertising. Yeah, you, you will have basically an iframe, a window, a tiny window, and in this iframe, you will have the the ads. Um, and at the moment, it is that the ads still have some possibility to see what's outside of the uh, iframe. So basically, what's what's the main page, uh, what's the domain, and they, there can be some communication. And this communication can also be used for tracking. So the privacy sandbox, in order to prevent tracking, will limit this. So the fence frames are really if you think about it like and you can think about it like an iframe where the content is really completely separated from the website so what's in the iframe will no, not have any chance to find out what's outside of the iframe um that brings a lot of problems um less tracking <laughs> uh less things like uh, you don't know what the referral is or on which page is the advertising so there is some some things some challenges that come with it um let's see what it what it is but uh, there's already also some adaptation. So we already see websites that use fence tracks. It's very little, but it's coming. Um, and the third thing is the topics API. Um, so that's interest-based ads. Um, also Google or the Chrome browser within its privacy sandbox is categorizing the, the websites and advertisers basically can ask the browser, hey, um, can I, I, I like to show ads for a certain category does this user fit this category? And then basically the, the, the ads can be shown based on these ad categories. Again, without the need of uh, the need for cookies, the no, without the need for tracking. In this case, the, the Chrome browser will do everything for us. Um, the problem with all of this is it's the Chrome browser. Uh, it's a kind of a black box situation um, controlled by Google in a certain way. Um, the IAB, for example, I had a, I also think I had 20 pages on a, like a long, long uh, PDF file with all their, um, let's say, criticism on the privacy sandbox. So there's a lot of discussion at the moment, um, but that's something that will definitely come in and that will definitely expand just due to Google being or Chrome being one of the major browsers. Right? Also, what will happen in the first quarter, uh, if you US publisher or if the US is important for you, 1st of July is the uh, date for the Oregon and the Texas law. Texas, I mean, Oregon is not so important. It's not the biggest, but Texas is quite big uh, in the sense of, of, of um, people that live there. So there's new US state laws that are focused on data protection. Uh, there is the need for the opt out of sale. There's a need for opt out of targeted ads and profiling. So you need to enable more options for users. You need to show uh, probably a CMP there, or at least a an, an opt out link, so that the users can do opt out. And you should prepare now because first of July is the is the date when it comes to force. Um, next slide, please. So and then um, just a quick look for um, yeah, basically the end of the year, Q3 and four um, things that might come or will come in some cases. Um, for example, currently there's a discussion on Switzerland uh, in the IEB. So uh, Switzerland is a bit like in between the seats. Some publishers are using the TCF in Switzerland, some are not using TCF in Switzerland. Um, some vendors care, some other vendors don't care. 
um, so it's yeah, in between somewhere. Um, there is a wish from from parties to uh, support um, some kind of TCF like thing in Switzerland. So that's very likely that there will be some some evolution in this direction. Um, also, India and Brazil are um, yeah, big economies um, that have significant uh, uh, privacy laws um, and a significant yeah, ad, well, advertising and publishing uh, um, economy. So it's also likely that we will see some developments in this direction. Um, also, uh, towards the end of the year, it is likely that uh, we will get rid of the TCF. Um, not as the TCF itself, as a policy, but um, as a technical framework, um, there is already GPP um, that, that is basically GPP is meant as a replacement, was always meant as a replacement, as a technical thing that com can combine all of them. Um, and it's time that, or there will be the time uh, in the probably near future that we will start a, a switch from the TCF API to the GPA, uh, GPP API. Um, the as yet, the policy requirements will be the same. The consent string will kind of look the same. Um, you will have the vendor list, etc. Uh, but for publishers, for example, you will probably need to either change the, the CMP code. If you have, uh, for example, a consent manager, you, you don't really need to change the code. But if you have uh, like these open source CMPs or these, let's say, um, not so expensive CMPs, then you might need to change the codes. Um, same in uh, if you have SDKs or app environments, you probably also need to um, become a bit more active. Um, and then also in the state laws, Montana will be uh, becoming to force uh, 1st of October. And then you also can or want to prepare for, for Iowa 1st of January. Uh, so more US state laws um, that you might uh, um, want to focus on. And that's the quick, well, not so quick, but that's the overview on this year on the legal basis. Yeah, back to you guys. Well, thanks a lot. Well, we're going to continue with the presentation. Uh, now it's over to you, Robin. Yes, Jan, thank you so much for uh, that overview of uh, all the coming changes with regards to uh, the privacy policy. Now let's focus on the, the question of this webinar. Does the uh, does the well deprecation of the cookies mean that we're going to see revenue losses for publishers? Nice. <laughs> okay, don't worry. It's not going to be that dramatic. Um, um, but, uh, we, we believe, uh, at least, um, that the, the ecosystem is going to maintain itself. And it, eventually, life will go on. Uh, please allow me to elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, this, by the way, is my cousin. Don't worry, that's not me with a mustache. Um, so what we have is uh, uh, what it is going to be deprecated is going to be the third-party cookies. Um, and this um, is what's being used uh, within the ecosystem. Of course, the whole programmatic ecosystem is much broader than what, what we have on screen over here. But uh, the most important factors are the SSPs, the DSPs, the advertisers, uh, and the publishers, and each one, um, of course, has their own interest in making sure that this transition from uh, uh, to a, a third-party-less uh, world is going to go smoothly. So um, let's have a look at some of the changes that are actually uh, going to happen. Um, so as we mentioned, uh, cookies are being deprecated. It's been quite clear this is the third party cookies. We'll go into uh, what they are, what the difference between first and third party cookies in a second. But this has basically been announced in 2020 already, uh, which means that the market has been having a long, long time uh, to start thinking about it and to start preparing itself um, for this new era of, uh, of privacy. Of course, right now it's being accelerated by all the legal changes that John mentioned before. Um, and uh, what we're seeing, though, so, so what we're seeing is that, for example, advertisers, they've been uh, actively looking for, uh, for, for solutions, uh, some of which we'll go into detail in as, as well. Uh, but just seeing, okay, how can we reach our, these customers without, uh, without actually using third-party cookies, uh, which in some cases might, for example, be first-party uh, data. Um, then we also have uh, third parties. These are indeed the Google, for example, Jan mentioned before, 
and the privacy sandbox, uh, which is being being developed, uh, an open source, uh, yeah, uh, project so to speak, uh, managed by Google. Uh, I was in a webinar with them the other day. They already mentioned that they, uh, well, Jan mentioned three solutions that they that were apparently working already, but they were in total were there were more than twenty already. Um, but the way we see it is that that these are uh, options, and then consent manager. Well, um, they're also well. Jan actually just showed that they're very much on top of what's happening in all with all the well, well, all the changes worldwide in in this sense to make sure um, that they're also staying on top and that their solution um, well uh, stays relevant and uh, provides the services that uh, their customers require. Um, and then, of course, from a publisher perspective, uh, well, right now, third-party cookies are very important for generating revenue. Um, and over time, we've seen, well, right now, seeing uh, implementation of a correct CMP is very important. So that's happening. That's uh, something that's happening right now. But um, at the same time, uh, they are moving towards um, uh, a phase where, well, at least the larger ones, maybe not so much the smaller ones, but are uh, experimenting uh, with first-party data and making sure that these can be, um, yeah, that this can actually also be used by the advertiser again, because that's the way it works. The, the advertisers lose their, their, their own third-party data. They need to make sure that they get, get access to this first-party data in one way or another. So actually a takeaway that I had uh, from the webinar the other day with Google was that they mentioned uh, the best thing that Google can do for the industry uh, to progress is to actually stick to the deadlines. The, the reason why I want to point this out is because since uh, this was uh, this change was announced in 2020, it has been postponed many, many times, and it was only this year that they actually started, um, yeah, to uh, to enforce it. Um, well, uh, and of course, there are commercial reasons uh, behind this. Uh, whole advertising industry is, of course, a multi-billion-dollar industry, so. Everybody wants to make sure that uh, things keep working the way they are working right now. Um, that being said, uh, advertisers are, of course, a key part of the of the ecosystem. The, they're the ones that are making the investments uh, to buy the advertising space um, uh, to run their campaigns. Uh, for them, it's, uh, it's, it's becoming increasingly uh, important to, to be able to buy the uh, the required advertising space uh, without the third party cookies because that's going to be what we're losing um, while still maintaining the same well hopefully accuracy of targeting and um, also of course the uh, the KPIs uh, or the performance metrics that they're looking at um, from our point like just in case there are any advertisers in this webinar we quickly wanted to show our uh, own um, First party solution that we are using. So at Refinery89, we have uh, what we call is a contextual plus um, solution. So this is our answer to the third party uh, cookie deprecation. What it does is uh, we scan all the articles on the uh, of the publishers that we work with, uh, which is the the contextual part. This means that we're scanning for keywords. Uh, we're scanning scanning whether articles might are positive or negative. Um, any negative articles, um, we do we do not include these uh, in our contextual database, and that uh, like that. Uh, but the problem with this is is that um, contextual are uh, contextual articles are only relevant at the moment that you're getting traffic for them. Say for example, a uh, article about uh, a tennis match is only relevant while uh, the tennis match is ongoing, and maybe a couple of hours after. Because three, four days after that, that article is not going to be uh, is not going to be attracting visitors anymore, and therefore the the contextual advertising on that specific page itself uh, will have lost its value. So what we do with the contextual plus is that uh, we're using in this case first party uh, cookies. Um, we link this to a user, and like this, we are using uh, AI based contextual. Um, we combine this with the contextual interest audiences. To make sure that we're actually building first-party audience, first-party audiences uh, for our advertisers. So, like this, we uh, no longer have an article that's relevant about tennis while the tennis match is ongoing, but we actually create an internal audience um, uh, of people that are interested 
in, um, in tennis in this case. But since we're using AI, uh, this also helps us uh, enrich this data uh, into much more detail. Of course, tennis is just a, uh, just a broad category. But if we combine, um, I don't know, tennis with automotive, for example, a very specific brand might be interested in that and say, okay, hey, this is indeed the segment uh, that I want to target. And then we can provide that uh, regardless of whether there's traffic for that uh, at this moment. We got a question uh, oh. from Zach. Zach. Yes. Do you want to <laughs> open your mic and, and shoot the question? Or I think you actually. Uh, sure. Go. Yeah, I put it in the chat also, but um, you'd mentioned uh, negative pages and articles would not be included in Contextual Plus. Could you please expand on the definition of a negative page or a negative article? Okay, so, um, well, let, let, let's say, for example, uh, the war in Ukraine that's ongoing right now. Um, but I would assume that any uh, report on what might be going on on battle, battlefield uh, will be seen as negative. I mean, it's the, um, how, how would you sum it up? We would, I would sum it up as the, the content that's generally not attractive for advertisers. So anything that... Uh, that might write about violence. It doesn't actually need to be uh, an, a very descriptive article, but just uh, the sense of, okay, hey, did, mm, it, it doesn't make somebody necessarily feel good um, uh, is what would be considered a, uh, a negative article. Like, it, it's the, the, that's the thing with the AI. It actually uh, analyzes the sentiments of the article. So like, okay, how, how would this make the user feel? Do, do I answer your question more or less like that? Uh, yes, but not, <laughs> but uh, in a somewhat nerve wracking way for somebody who works. Yeah, in that was, so actually so, something that we want to do is uh, for our publishers at least is, um, well, it's, it's still going to take a little bit of time, but soon and make this insightful into for our publishers. So actually share this uh, contextual data or the contextual scanning with you so that our publishers are all actually able to see for themselves which articles are being defined uh, as negative and which ones are being defined as, uh, as positive in this sense. So hopefully that, <laughs> that, that, that will take away your worries a little bit. But um, in, in general, any, anything, I guess you could say uh, war, uh, maybe a car crash, um, um, maybe, uh, let's see, other negative news could be um, uh, burglaries in a, in, a, in a certain neighborhood. Mm. I, yeah, so like that would be more than stuff, half of a news publisher is negative. negative. All right. Okay, thanks. Right. Yeah, like, for instance, I mean, AI would be able to tell, for instance, a uh, house is on fire, which is negative. Or a striker is on is on fire, which means he's scoring a whole lot of goals. So negative, positive, the AI actually understands the content. Yeah, I, I understand. It's uh, uh you know, again, as someone who publishes news content, um, you know, it's obviously a disconcerting prospect that uh using an analysis like this could dictate or could change somebody's approach to what they actually cover and you know and what stories they produce because of what's profitable versus what isn't yeah but that, that's the thing it's it's it um it, it doesn't matter even if you were to uh were to do that 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 shouldn't be an issue because in the end the context uh, the content the contextual part of the articles so of the positive articles is there just to build the audiences uh, those audiences are then to be actually employed by um, uh, by the advertisers uh, to run their campaigns. So it could well be that um, even though, let's say, 80% of your uh, articles are being scanned as negative, you will still get the, your, uh, the same, well, uh, relatively like the same investment from advertisers um, because uh, the audience is being taken from somewhere else. Right, I, I understand what you're saying. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so we, we definitely do not want to dictate what you write about. It's a, it's a free press. <laughs> you're good, Zach? We can move on? 
Yeah, go ahead. I didn't want to uh, carry such an interruption. All right, so, awesome. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, so, um, all right. Okay. I need to get back on my train thought now. Um, so we, uh, as mentioned before, we also have the SSPs and the DSPs uh, in the mix over here. Um, we think it's important to mention them in the middle because in the end, um, we need to make sure that the data, for example, as with the contextual plus solution, actually is being shown uh, or is being given to the, uh, to the advertiser. So, um, well, uh, we need to do make sure that that's, of course, done uh, in a way that, uh, well, uh, the advertiser gets the data, and at the same time, through the SSPs and DSPs, uh, they are saying can keep using this. So, right now, most of the, this data is only, uh, at least for the Contextual Plus, for example, is only available through, uh, for, uh, through direct uh, sales or I.O. purchases, but uh, we are uh, exploring the options right now uh, to make that available as well uh, in a programmatic manner. And just like us, there are going to be other party, parties that are working with first-party data that are uh, all looking for the same solutions. Of course, there are some solutions out there already, um, uh, but it's just a matter of uh, well, the industry finding out um, what is going to be the leading uh, method of uh, making sure that this first-party data is being sold to the advertisers. And that's going to be probably a recurring theme also in other parts. Uh, and then the same with the CMP, um, like ConsentManager.net, ConsentManager.net is our uh, is the CMP that we actually provide our publishers with. Um, they need to make sure that uh, yeah that their product uh, respects the local requirement or the local uh, legal requirements uh, at that moment. So to give an example, especially for the Dutch publishers in here, um, in Spain and uh, Spain, France, and Italy. Uh, about um, about two months ago, they introduced the uh, uh, well. Uh, new le legislation was enforced that uh, made uh, that now means that all CMPs in Spain need to have reject all buttons uh, through which a user can easily reject all uh, all cookies. But at the same time, of course, the accept all button is still there, which allows uh, third party cookies for the moment. Of course, in the future, uh, that's going to be uh, first party cookies only that are allowed. And then, of course, the settings button is there for anything in between um, accepting anything in between accepting them all and rejecting them all. So I wanted to uh, for, uh, distinguish a little bit further between first-party cookies and third-party cookies to make sure that now that third-party cookies are being phased out, um, we're exactly clear on what is uh, yeah what are what is being phased out. So what is allowed to stay are going to be the first-party cookies. So these are uh, cookies that are set by by the website domain uh, that the user is visiting. So this is normally made uh, done uh, for user experience on the website and remembering stuff like uh, login credentials. On the other side, we have third-party cookies. So this is set by domains other than the one uh, the, uh, the user is currently using. So typically used for tracking, uh, advertising purposes, etc. So it's the third-party cookies which Google is focusing on right now. Uh, on deprecating. So, going back to the third-party Google deprecation from Google, um, it was earlier this year that they actually, as mentioned before, they started enforcing this um, at a rate of one percent of all the uh, all the users are currently running uh, without third-party cookies. Um, and this is well, this got this is what everybody uh, got everybody worried from the start. So I thought it would be good to um, elaborate a little bit further on that, uh, on how the process is going to go. So right now, we're, uh, they are testing uh, with 1% of the of cookies. This testing period is going to last until ju at least July 2024. Um, then there's a standstill period uh, in which the CMA, which is the British uh, Privacy Watchdog, so to speak, um, is going to evaluate uh, the solutions um, uh, yeah, um, for targeting in a, with, without third-party cookies. This period is going to last for anywhere between 60 to 20 days. Then there is going to be some time uh, in case there are any objections from the CMA to make sure that the yeah that they can make changes. And then at the earliest um, in Q4, so it's anywhere perhaps between September and November, 
that they're going to start the total phase out of the, the third party cookies. Um, I thought it was interesting if, uh, the way they phrased it that it's phase out, that it's, it appears that it's going to be a gradual process, not from one day to the other. But that remains to be seen um, later on this year how exactly that's going to take uh, take shape. Um, so in the meantime, of course, um, everybody else in the industry is uh, is going to try and get ready. So they're going to uh, they're looking at options to compensate for the loss of the uh, third party cookies. As we, we already mentioned, the contextual solution. Um, well, there are other contextual solutions out there, of course, as well. There are, uh, Jan, I think, mentioned a couple of uh, options as well. And other than that, there's uh, things like universal IDs uh, or data clean rooms, which, again, all uh, are options in the sense of, OK, how can we make sure that the, yeah, the, that the industry keeps going? So going back to the question, will the end of the third party cookies impact publishers' revenue? Um, the honest answer is, well, we can't be 100% sure right now. And the reason we can't be 100% sure is that uh, right now they're only testing, we're only testing this on a very small percentage of the traffic. Um, there are many solutions which are being developed um, by Google, but of course also by others. I keep repeating Google because, well, not only because we're a Google partner, but because like it or not, they are also very dominant in this industry. Uh, and they will most likely have a say in how fast this is going to go. If uh, if Google can't find uh, a proper working solution uh, towards the end of the year, um, let's be honest with ourselves, it's quite likely that they're going to postpone it um, because in the end they also don't want to make, uh, make a loss. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit our take that uh, in the end, the market will decide on the best solutions and self-adapt to um, uh, to the deprecation of the third party cookies, meaning that uh, there should be no revenue loss. Everybody should be okay uh, as long as you know you're not sleeping under a rock. We do have to keep paying attention and make sure that uh, yeah, we, we do actually implement the, uh, the correct solutions as soon as they become more widely available. But until that time, it's very important to keep our eyes open uh, and pay attention to what the market is uh, is doing. So yeah, that being said, I uh, open the floor to any questions that uh, that might be out there. Yeah. Also, Jan, if you want to give um, a short summary in case you, because we skipped the last part because of uh, time constraint. So if you want to give a short recap or anything you want to say, considering the the big question. The, the the big question. No, I, I just wanted to say maybe um in, in regards to the to the Google thing. Yeah, so it's it's going to phase out. <clears throat> Indeed, the the big question is how long, how much, and uh, will it change? Um, there was some, I mean, some heavy pushback for the privacy sandbox, uh, for example, and uh, I think I, I actually read that the CMA is thinking about. In basically telling Google to not deprecate the, the third-party cookies in case when there is not a um, a vital solution. Um, so it's going to be interesting what what will come there. Um, there will be something, right? So cookie third-party cookies they will go away, but it's it's really really unsure how it will go away. Uh, but I think the 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 summary that you made and that that's that that's the the good part for all of us um, is Google or all of the players have a big interest in keeping the ad revenues, and therefore I don't I don't think that anybody needs to fear that the revenues are going down. They will just we will just need to find new ways of achieving same, the same goals or similar goals, right? All right. Well, now it's it's up to you guys. If if you have any questions, uh, feel free to open your your mix, uh, your mics, and of course the chat should be open now. Um, I did get one question um, through the email. <laughs> it seems that chat wasn't working. Sorry about that. Um, and the question is, 
what impact do you guys think uh, will the elimination of third-party cookies have on ad price and, and CPM rates of uh, my inventory? I guess this is a publisher asking. Yeah, uh, I guess it's more for me than uh, yeah. <laughs> than for Jan. Um, well, th this depends. That depends also on the depends on the inventory. I mean, um, with first-party data, of course, becoming more um, important in that sense. Um, it's the kind of first-party data that can be generated. So a publisher that um, maybe has a very niche audience um, will be able to do, will be able to generate first-party data that is then able to uh, sell for quite a high price. But at the same time, a more general uh, uh, publisher that writes has a more general audience, um, of course, will have a, a much larger audience but the prices uh, might be relatively lower. It's also a little bit, what, what can be done with that data? I mean, it's one, one thing is just, okay, hey, uh, uh, this user visited my website, so to speak. Um, but if you are able to, somehow, if that data is able to somehow be enriched, um, well, might actually even be beneficial uh, or like positive in that sense. And uh, you might be able to gain, uh, get a higher CPM than you're currently doing. Uh, that would then also actually raise the question, why you're not already doing that right now? <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, well, we, we are getting some questions over the, over the chat. Um, the, Alba is asking, any ideas on how affiliate commission attribution will work without cookies? Some of them are second party, but some are not. Uh, will contextual manage that part? Oof. Um, that's a very good question. I haven't mm -hmm. thought about that yet, but I need uh, could, like something like contextual. That would be my go-to answer. Um, um, yeah, I, I think something like contextual could well could actually already benefit uh, when it comes to affiliate marketing uh, at this point because you're no longer uh, trying to reach a broad, a broad audience, but you're already specifying it uh, before. Okay, and um, another question from very quickly on, Sin on this. Oh, uh, since it's 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 kind of similar as the the Google um, consent mode problem, so to say, meaning uh, what happens when you click on the ad? Can you actually track it? Uh, can you track the conversion? Um, that's what I read from mm -hmm. the from the question. If you, how do the affiliates will get the commission if you can't track the the, the conversion? Um, Google Consent Mode is basically um, they're trying to model the conversions that they don't see, and I think that that's in long term um, more vendors will do a similar uh, or will take a similar approach. If you can't or if you can only count, let's say, fifty percent of the users because it's only fifty percent that say uh, that click on accept, then you will need to count the other fifty percent by yeah forecasting, modeling, whatever. Um, and try to find these conversions in the model somewhere. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yes. Uh, another question regarding the Google report uh, back on 2019, I think it was, um, that it predicted the significant revenue losses. How can that be interpreted? Um. Well, uh, how can it be interpreted? <laughs> um, if, well, I, I, I get, um, and, and I don't know which report is being referred to. All in all honesty, um, what my 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 thoughts are is that, uh, of course, the the report was made without any uh, without actually forcing the industry uh, to start thinking about it. So that's what actually has been done over the past three years. That okay by by announcing it by. Um, and forcing it on one percent of the traffic, um, you're actually forcing uh, change in a sense. Uh, while, uh, well, while well, well, back in 2019, it, it was maybe only theoretical, and, uh, and and nobody really was forced to put time and effort into it because nothing was on the line. Right now, um, well, there's a whole industry on the line, so to speak. So, um, uh, so one way or another, they will actually find a, somebody will find a way to make sure that this works. That's my interpretation of it. Right. Um, 
the other question I got is, um, what role will content management platforms play in the future advertising strategies and how I can integrate them effectively? I guess, Jan, this is more for you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, from a, from a publisher's perspective, what's, what becomes more and more relevant, I mean, it's been relevant before, but even more, uh, uh, how high is my acceptance rate? How high is my bounce rate? How can I optimize the whole thing? Um, that's the the obvious things. Um, what we see in the past and in, in the last few months, things like how does my CMP perform or how does the CMP performance uh, influence the performance of my own website? Things like the the Google Core, um, uh, the Google Web Vitals, these kind of things. Um, does it change my 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 SEO? These kind of things. Um, that's becoming more and more important. Um, so not really um, factors that change the user or the user be behavior, but more how Google or search engines will see it. Uh, so that's a that's a big thing uh, that we're working on at the moment, for example. Um, privacy laws are increasing. Um, there's more and more countries that, that will have privacy laws. We, we saw it on the agenda, Brazil, India, et cetera. So there will be more and more where you need to have a CMP where you need to have some standardization where you need to have um yeah find some ways to still be able to monetize and um yeah the CMPs will will be there as the yeah as the anchor point for these publishers to try to put it all under one under one hood so to say yeah yeah fantastic uh well we're not getting any more questions um so well Thank you very much, everybody, for, for attending. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Robin, for your time. And uh, well, you, here are some emails in case, uh, you, well, actually, you can write to us uh, through the website hey, in case sorry. you have any questions. Or... Sorry, everyone. I, sorry, everyone. I had one more, if that's OK. Uh, OK, sorry, Zach. <laughs> yeah, I tried. No, I was typing while uh, you were wrapping up. My bad. Um, I'll just read it off since my mic's open now. Um, uh, since both uh, Robin and Jan, you both seem pretty confident uh, the situation will sort itself out in the long term uh, based on market solutions and demand. But what about the impact on revenue in the short term? Um, you know, we've seen when these technology shifts happen, uh, publishers sometimes tend to get hit. Uh, platforms, advertising platforms tend to take a hit until you know, everything kind of resolves itself. So what's, you know, what are we in for in the short term here? Yeah, so the, this is what I was referring to, that um, in, in order to make sure that in, in the short term, um, I, mean, I mean, let's be honest, probably some uh, publishers are going to get hit, but those will be the publishers that either are independent and they are not, uh, not really aware of what's happening in the industry and therefore sort of leave it until it's too late, or they work with a partner that uh, leaves it until it's too late. So um, uh, th that's why I said, as long as um, uh, the partner, it, it, well, either if you work independently or if you, the partner that you work with needs to make sure that they stay on top of what's happening in the market. Um, and then uh, what we're gonna see, okay, so right now it's going through a testing period, and then at a certain point, things are gonna go very quickly. Uh, and it's very important that at that point that things go quickly, that that change happens, that that you that you are there to react. That's the way to to minimize or uh, com well or not see any uh, revenue losses whatsoever. Uh, also, going a little bit back to the Google schedule, um, they're planning to start phasing out the third-party cookies in Q4 of the year, which I think is absolutely horrible timing. But at the same time, I think that means uh, since that's the best uh, time of the year, um, that as soon as they will, that as soon as something is being rolled out, they will also make sure that uh, the publishers that they work with uh, are and do actually have the solutions uh, ready to make sure that uh, uh, yeah their revenue is not being impacted in what is uh, the period of the year, which for some publishers mean more and more than half of their total uh, or their annual annual revenue. Don't if you want to add anything to that, uh, Jan. Yeah, no, I, basically the same. Yeah. What we see in, on our end is uh, publishers tend to be 
a bit late or everybody actually tends to be a bit late um and that's that's when you yeah when you get hit with losses so uh, yeah be on track with the with the news with the technology with the, with the new things that are coming and then and there's usually enough time to prepare but you yeah you need to prepare right so that's the thing that's why we're having this uh, this webinar here today to just talk about it to be ready and prepare Okay, thanks for uh, commenting at the end there, guys. Appreciate it. No problem. Worries. And Patel, um, and Sid, of course, mentions, uh, it'd be very nice to keep being updated every now and then about what is happening and what impact it should have on business. Of course, uh, you can count on it. And this is the, well, this is the third webinar that we do. Uh, eventually, we will have, we'll be having more um, and you will be, uh, Post it. Uh, we will promote them through, through our social networks, um, via emails, uh, and of course on the website. So, so we will let you know, of course. Well, having said that, uh, once again, thank you very much, everybody, for for being here. Jan, Robin, thanks a lot again. Um, nice. Hopefully, this is the first of many. That, well, it's actually the second uh, with you, Jan. So. Hopefully it's the second of many more to come. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, bye.